The Book of Jeremiah, Part 8 We have seen sentence pronounced against Judah and Jerusalem in the time of Zedekiah. We have seen spiritual types of the coming of the Antichrist through the historical example of the coming of the King of Babylon. We have seen that God promised the children that if they would turn from their wicked ways and do the things which were right and judge fairly and judge the fatherless and the widow and walk after the word of the Lord and keep his commandments and his statutes that he would not remove them. However, they were a stiff-necked and hard-headed people and they would not hearken unto the Lord. As a matter of fact, they prophesied against the word of Jeremiah, saying, You shall have peace in this place. They didn't understand. Just as many today do not understand the prophecies of this book, and other books that go along with it. But now we're going to have a change of thought in Jeremiah 26. We're going to go back in time a little bit. We're going to go back to the reign of Jehoiakim, which is before Zedekiah. Zedekiah, of course, being the last king of Judah, which would be taken into captivity. And uh, we're going to see here that uh, we're uh, looking back in time rather than going forward from the point we were at. In other words, Jeremiah 26, as in most places in the Bible, is not really written in the proper chronology. Um, Whether this is a look back or whether it's just when they uh, translated the Bible, they got things out of order is not really known. It's probably a look back. But anyway, we're going to begin today in Jeremiah chapter 26 and we're going back in time, back to the reign of Jehoiakim. And we're going to hear the words of the Lord against the uh, king of Judah and against the people of the land. In other words, Jerusalem and Judea, the the, uh, tribe of Judah, in other words. So, without a big intro and uh, a lot of uh, going off on a tangent here, we're just going to start with Jeremiah 26.1. And before we do, as always, let us go to our Father in prayer and ask for guidance and wisdom as we study this, His most holy word. Our glorious, righteous, heavenly Father, a God in which there is no iniquity, a God alone, for there is no other God with you, we come before your throne, Father, and we ask, Father, that you Open our eyes and ears to the truth, and all who study with us. We ask that you direct our every word, our every saying, so that these words glorify your name. We ask you to show us things through spiritual type, example, prophetical, historical, and any means necessary according to your will. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahushua the Messiah. Amen. So, chapter 26 of Jeremiah and verse 1. And like I said, we're going back in time here. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, in other words, unto Jeremiah, saying, Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. In other words, the gathering place of the crowd. In other words, as they come in to worship. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. In other words, you say every single word, every single syllable, that I speak unto you to say unto them, and don't diminish one word from it. Verse 3. If so be they will hearken 
and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I propose to do unto them, because of the evil of their doings. Verse 4. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, If you will not hearken unto me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, verse 5, to hearken unto the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Verse 6, Then I shall make this place like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all nations of the earth. Now you've got a strange, uh, kind of a contradiction here. Shiloh means peaceful place. And of course, uh, Shiloh uh, was the place where the tabernacle had once been. And it had moved because of the same kinds of things that were going on here. And it was laid waste. In other words, it became a desolation. But you've got a deeper type here. In other words, I will make this house like Shiloh, a peaceful place, but it will still be a curse to all nations. Well, how is it that the Antichrist comes in? Peacefully and prosperously, as written in the book of Daniel. They cry, peace, 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 and sudden destruction. In other words, as they're crying, peace, 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 then cometh sudden destruction. Verse 7. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Verse 8. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all the uh, all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him saying thou shalt surely die. Now Compare this to, to the time of Christ, where the scribes and Pharisees, who were the priests, the uh, interpreters of the law, and probably, actually, when it comes down to it, of the same ilk. In other words, the same family seed line. But you've got priests and prophets here telling Jeremiah, Thou shalt surely die. Real religious folk. Verse 9. And they also said, that now I'm putting this in, they also said, we're continuing in verse 9, Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Verse 10. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord, and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Verse 11. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes, and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye heard with your own ears. Now equate this to the time of Christ, where they brought in false witnesses, who said, this man said he would tear down the temple and build it again in three days. They had no understanding of what Christ was actually talking about. By his temple, or by the temple, he meant his body. Not the house of the Lord. Uh, the, the brick building. Because his body was the house of the Lord. In dwelling with man, his clay vessel, the vessel that he dwelled in, was the house of the Lord. Verse 12. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Verse 13. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent him of the evil which he hath pronounced against you. Verse 14. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. In other words, do with me as you will. Verse 15. But know for certain that if you put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves. 
and upon this city, and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth the Lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. In other words, he wanted you to hear this. Verse 16. Then said the princes to all the people, unto the priests, and to the prophets, This man is not worthy to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Verse 17. Then rose up certain of the elders of the land. Elders of, are, of course, uh, those that are old and wise, probably older priests, which were not uh, taken in so much by this uh, idol worship and stuff that had gone on. And spake to all the assembly of the people, saying, verse 18, Micah the Morishite, prophesied in the days of Hezekiah king of Judah and spake to all the people of Judah saying thus saith the Lord of hosts Zion shall be plowed down like a field and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house as high as the high places of a forest in other words uh the high places of a forest or places of worship in the groves. Verse 19. Did Hezekiah, the king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord, and the Lord repented him of the evil which he pronounced against them? Thus we might procure great evil against our souls. In other words, if we put this Jeremiah to death. Verse 20. And there was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shimei of kirkath And of course, kirkath would usually be a place where the Kenites came out of, but this man was a holy man. So just because you see the word kirkath necess- or doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the people there are evil. And concerning this one, uh, Uriah the son of Shimei, they're, they're continuing to speak, who prophesied against the city and against the land according to all the words of Jeremiah. In other words, he said the same thing Jeremiah has said. So we've got three witnesses here. We've got Jeremiah, we've got Micah, and we had this one Uriah. Verse 21, And when Jehoiakim the king and all his mighty men and all the princes thereof heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But Uriah heard it, and he was afraid, and he fled and went to Egypt. Which was kind of a mistake on his part to run to Egypt. Verse 22, And Jehoiakim the king sent men to Egypt, namely Elnathan, the son of Akbor, And certain men with him into Egypt, verse 23, And they fetched forth Urijah out of Egypt, and brought him unto Jehoiakim the king, who slew him with the sword, and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. In other words, he was buried with the poor, this uh, prophet of God. And this is one of the prophets spoken of when you read of the innocent blood shed in the city, which God said was not to be done, verse 24. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, and of obviously this man having some clout with the people, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. Jeremiah chapter 27 and verse 1. In other words, God protected Jeremiah, okay, as he, as he promised he would. Jeremiah chapter 27 and verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Verse 2. Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them on thy neck. In other words, I want to make you, I want you to make a yoke as you might... Uh, saddle an oxen with or put around the neck of an oxen and it's 
going to be going to have bonds with it. In other words, I want you to make it where it's chained up, where you're trapped in it. Verse 3. And send them to the king of Edom, and to the king of Moab, and to the king of the Ammonites, and to the king of Tyrus, and to the king of Zidon, by hand of the messengers which come to Jerusalem unto Zedekiah the king of Judah. In other words, now we're back to uh, Zedekiah, meaning that uh, this would take place over the time between Jehoiakim and uh, Zedekiah king of Judah. In other words, it's, it's going to take a while for uh, these uh, bands to go to all these places. And Jeremiah is going to walk around wearing them. Verse 4. Uh, and command and command them to say unto their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say unto your masters. Verse 5. I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power, and by my outstretched arm. And I have given it to whom it seemed meet unto me. In other words, to whom it seemed good unto me. Verse 6. And now I have given these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Remember, my servant. Nebuchadnezzar was the servant of God, even in the wickedness that he did. And it really wasn't wicked, because he was serving God. But um, God put him into power. And this will be something that translates in the book of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar will learn a valuable lesson about uh, how he came to power. It wasn't by his own hand as he thought. But remember my servant and the beast of the field I have given him to serve him. Verse 7. And all nations shall serve him. Again look forward to the prophetical type of the king of Babylon to come. Okay, get your, get your prophetical thinking cap on, because we're talking prophecy here. All nations shall serve him. In other words, the king of Babylon of the end time is the Antichrist, and all nations, the world government, shall serve him. And his son, and his son's son. And you could relate this to the uh, Kenites, who bring in the world power, who bring in world government, with a little bit of help from old Uncle Esau and his socialist system, until the very time of his land come. So then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. And go right to the book of Revelation. At how many kings are drunk with the wine of fornication with the harlot, Mystery Babylon? In other words, as always... From these this, these books, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and, and even Ezekiel when we get to it, you're seeing prophecy against their own time, in other words, the time of these writings, and from these writings, you're seeing prophecies against our time. Verse 8. And it shall come to pass that the nation and the kingdom which shall not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of uh, Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword, with the famine, and with the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. So, in other words, God is saying, all nations are going into the captivity of the king of Babylon. And that is what is prophesied in the book of Revelation. The whole world shall wander after the beast. The whole world wandered after the beast. And this is what is being referred to here prophetically to our time. Not only that, but to their time, it also took place to the uh, nations that they knew. So you've got to rightly divide the word to be able to understand this. This prophecy is both for their time and our time. And again, this is the supernatural ability of our Father's word to speak to two generations at the same time. Something no other book can do. Verse 9. 
Therefore hearken ye not to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon. Verse 10. For they prophesy a lie unto you. In other words, you are going into captivity of the king of Babylon. And to us also, we are going into the captivity of global government and the king of Babylon. There is no getting around it. To remove you far from your land, that I should drive you out, and that you should and ye should perish. Verse eleven. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, and they shall till it and shall dwell therein. In other words, when this king of Babylon comes, if you let him take you into bondage, then you're going to live and you're going to till your own ground and I'm not going to remove you from the land. In other words, this was for the correction of the people. Just as it shall be when the Antichrist comes. We're going into captivity and there's no use in fighting against it. When we go into captivity, though, the election will prophesy against this king of Babylon of the end time, Satan, Lucifer, the Antichrist, and they shall convert many. Even the gainsayers will be convinced. <clears throat> and many will wake up in that day. And they will stand with their brothers against the Antichrist. Verse 12. I spare also to Zedekiah the king of Judah according to all these words. Saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon to serve him and his people and live. And Zedekiah would do this for a short time, I think about a three-year period or so, but then he rebelled. Verse 13, Why will ye die, thou and thy people, by the sword, and by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? In other words, this is part of God's plan. Negative though it may be, it is part of God's plan that the children shall serve the king of Babylon, both of that time, the historical king of Babylon, and both of our time, the king of Babylon, the king of confusion, in other words, Satan the Antichrist. And by serving him, that does not mean that you're to bow a knee to him. You are never to worship him. But when that time comes, if you do not act accordingly, using the cunning of Daniel against him, then the people are going to point you out and you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. So, in other words, when the false Christ comes and, and the people start yelling, Christ is returned, Christ is returned, you don't have to let them know that you know he's the Antichrist. It won't do you any good anyway. You're not going to convince anybody at that point. Just yell, praise the Lord. Or yell, Hallelujah. Only what it means in your heart will differ from what they think you mean. And you won't be detected until it's time for you to be delivered up. Your time will come. It is written you shall have tribulation ten days. Verse 14. Therefore hearken not to the words of the prophets that speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. In other words, you are going into captivity. The whole world is going into captivity of the king of Babylon of the end times. Verse 15. For I have not sent them. In other words, talking about these prophets, saith the Lord. Yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I might be driven out, and that ye might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. In other words, prophesying lies unto you. Verse 16. Also I spake to the priests... And to all this people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hawker not to the words of your prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessel of the Lord's house shall now shortly be brought back again from Babylon. For they prophesy a lie unto you. In other words, they would not be brought back. Verse 17. Hearken not unto them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. 
Wherefore should this city be laid waste? In other words, if you don't serve the king of Babylon, you're going to uh, be killed and the city's going to be laid waste. Now again, there is a difference between serving the king of Babylon and worshiping the king of Babylon for our time. We're going into captivity, okay? There's nothing going to stop that. Global government, world government, world unity, world community, whatever you want to call it, is already in place. They're removing our rights. They're changing our laws. They're doing away with our Constitution. They're going to make the United States just a voice in the chorus rather than the superpower of all superpowers. And it's going to be done peacefully and prosperously. There will be a deadly wound at first. But after that deadly wound, we will be going into captivity. But that captivity will be short-lived, five months according to the book of Revelation. And if the word of the Lord that be with them, or, or if the word of the Lord be with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts, that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, and in the house of the king of Judah, and at Jerusalem, go not to Babylon. In other words, if the Lord's with them, let them pray that the rest of the vessels don't go to Babylon. Verse 19. For thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, and concerning the sea, and concerning the bases, and concerning the residue of those vessels which remain in the city. And of course, when we're talking about the sea here, and the pillars, and the vessels, we're talking about the things that Solomon had made in the house of the Lord. This is not talking about the literal sea. Verse 20. Which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, took not. In other words, he didn't take, take those things yet. When he carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the nobles of Judah and of Jerusalem, or and Jerusalem. Verse 21. Yea, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord, and in the house of the king of Judah, of Jerusalem. Verse 22. They shall be carried to Babylon. And they shall be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. And I will bring them up and restore them to this place. In other words, after that 70 year captivity, that's when you're going to see the vessels returned. But not before. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month of Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, which was at Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now, that's a lie. That is a lie. He has not broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Verse 3. Within two full years I will bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. That's another lie. That will not happen. Verse 3, or verse 4. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, and all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord. And I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. A third lie. Verse 5. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priests, and in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, verse 6, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. In other words, wouldn't it be nice if he would do that? The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessel of the Lord's house, and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. In other words, what, he, what he's saying is, it would be very nice if that would happen. I wish the Lord would do that. Verse 7. Nevertheless, hear now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. Verse 9. The prophets that have been before me 
And before the uh, before the of old, both prophesied against many countries and against the great kingdoms of war, of evil, and of pestilence. Verse 9. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. In other words, these ones are crying peace, 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 but there's not going to be any peace. So what Jeremiah is saying here is, you, you prophets that are prophesying a peace, when that comes to pass, then we're going to know that the Lord hath truly sent you. Verse 10. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it. In other words, as a symbology of the king of Babylon's yoke being removed. Only it's a lie. Verse 11. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, off the neck of all nations, within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. In other words, he didn't argue with him about it. He just went his way, because he knows that God is going to deal with this one. Verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, verse 13, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make them for yokes of iron. In other words, the yoke that Jeremiah had made was of wood, but now it's going to even be worse. It's going to be iron. And iron is something that you will not break. Iron is that which subdues all metals. Unless, of course, they be a denser metal. But during this time, anyway, verse 14. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have given the beasts of the field also. Verse 15. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. Verse 17, So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year in the seventh month. And of course the seventh month is uh, the time of harvest. But uh, that's really got nothing to do with what we're talking about here. But uh, this Hananiah was preaching rebellion against the Lord. In other words, he was saying the words that Jeremiah the prophet were saying were not true. So he was rebelling against the Lord. He's calling the Lord a liar, basically. Because the Lord did speak through Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29, and verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 2. After that Jeconiah the king... And the queen, and the eunuchs, and the princes of Judah, and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. In other words, after they had gone into captivity. Verse 3. By the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, the king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, saying, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem into Babylon. <clears throat> Who caused this to happen? Was it Zedekiah? Was it the king of Babylon? No. It was our father. He is correcting his children as he promised he would. Verse 5. Build ye houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Verse 6, Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters for husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. In other words, similar to what happened in Egypt. 
Verse 7. And seek the peace in the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. In other words, live there peaceably. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof ye shall have peace. Verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. Verse 9. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. And again, you can equate this to many pastors and reverends and um, priests to this very day. They prophesy a lie. They teach the rapture. In other words, this people shall certainly not go into captivity. We're going to fly away. We're going to escape before that happens. We shall not see the tribulation. Verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, in other words, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, the geographical location, but also in confusion, I will visit you, and I will perform my good towards you in causing you to return to this place. Which would happen. They would return. And we know this because uh, in the time of Christ, they were back in the land again. Of course, at that time, the Kenites were bearing rule over the priest's office and the scribeship. And they were the money changers and the bankers. And, you know, that's, that's what the Kenites love is money and power and glory. Their own glory, that is to say. Verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil. To give you an expected end. Um, how do you give an expected end? How can it be expected? Well, if you know about it, it's expected. Verse 12. Then ye shall call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Verse 13. And ye shall seek me, and find me. And ye shall search for me with all your heart, which is to say all your mind. Verse 14. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord. I will bring you again to the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. And this is speaking to Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes, and of course the Levites that were among them, plus the Kenites, they were carried away captive. This is not in any wise referring to the ten northern tribes of Israel that have gone now over the Caucasus Mountains and are beginning to settle Europe. Because we're uh, 150-something years now past their captivity to Assyria. Assyria has been destroyed. It is now the property of Babylon. In other words, the king of Babylon came in and took Assyria. So now what was Assyria is now the property of the king of Babylon and the Israelites of the ten northern tribes, which is to say Samaria or Ephraim as we have covered, have moved on over the Caucasus Mountains and are becoming the European nations. Verse 15. Because ye have said the Lord raised up unto us prophets in Babylon. In other words, in, uh, in, in our captivity. Even in confusion, the Lord has raised up prophets. Verse 16, Know that thus saith the Lord, the king that sitteth on the throne of David, and all of the people that dwelleth in his city, and your brethren that are not gone forth with you into captivity. Verse 17, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. In other words, we've got an example here. You can pretty much guess who this Hananiah and these prophets that were prophesying in rebellion against God were. They were Kenites. They were those bad figs. Verse 18. And I will persecute them with the sword and with the famine and with the pestilence and deliver them to be removed to all kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and an astonishment. And the Kenites were removed 
And they would be a curse to all the earth, as they are a curse to all the earth even nowadays, because they hold all the power, they hold half the world's money, they control the media, the movies, the radio, most all outlets of information, the internet, they control everything. They control the educational system, they teach your children that they're apes, and not created by God. They control so many things till it's unbelievable how much power they have. But they are blessed of God. Because God promised them that they would never want for a man to stand before them. Because unlike Israel, his children, they were willing to be loyal to their father, Satan. Uh, their father also, Jehonadab. But in other words, the Kenites keep the will of their father. And they are the sons of Cain who was fathered by Satan. And they don't stray from it. Whereas the children of Israel, <laughs> just look at the books that we've covered, how many times they've strayed away from God. And they're going to be a curse and an astonishment and a hissing and a reproach among all nations where I have driven them. Verse 19. Because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord which I sent them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but they would not hear, saith the Lord. As a matter of fact, rather they killed most of them. Verse 20. Hear ye therefore the word of the Lord, all ye of the captivity, whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 21. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, of Ahab, and of Koliah, Koliah means the voice of God, quite frankly, and of Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, which prophesy a lie unto you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of the Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. In other words, you that are there in captivity, who are in captivity, and are being peaceful, and living as I have told you to live, building houses, rearing up children and planting vineyards, you're going to see your own king killed before your eyes. You will witness it. Verse 22. And of them shall be taken up a curse by all of the captivity of Judah which are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. And, uh, you know, there's a real good connotation here for those of you with uh, spiritual eyes to see it. The king of Babylon being Satan, the Antichrist, roasting a king in the fire. What do you think is going to happen to those that follow the Antichrist if they do not amend their ways during the millennium? In other words, during the reign of Christ when he's here for a thousand years and teaches with his elect and his apostles. They're going to roast in the fire. And just like this king Ahab, they're going to die. Only they're not going to die of the flesh. Their souls are going to die. The second death written of in the book of Revelation after the great white throne judgment. Verse 23. Because they have committed villainy in Israel and have committed adultery with their neighbors, wives, and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them, even I know and am a witness, saith the Lord. In other words, <laughs> you can have no greater witness against you or for you than God. Verse 24. Thus shall thou also speak unto Shemiah the Nehilamite, saying, verse 25, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Because thou, in other words, because you, Shemiah, have sent letters in thy name unto all the people, that are at Jerusalem, and to, and to Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, in other words, these will be the words that Shimei wrote, verse 26, The Lord hath made thee priests instead of Jehoiada, the priest, that ye should be officers in the house of the Lord. For every man is mad, and maketh himself a prophet. Now thou shouldest put them into prison, and into stocks. In other words, what uh, Shimei wants to do here is remove the true priests and put them into prison and into stocks 
and replace them with their own priests. And more than likely, you're going to find out that this one is a Kenite, the Shimei, the Nehilamite. Verse 27. Now, therefore, why hast thou not reproved Jeremiah of Anathoth, which maketh himself a prophet unto you? In other words, why haven't you thrown him in jail? Verse 28. For therefore he sent letters unto us in Babylon, saying, This captivity is long. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Which is exactly what God told him to say. Verse 29. And Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the ears of Jeremiah the prophet. Verse 30. And the word of the Lord came to came unto Jeremiah, saying, Verse 31. Send to all of them of the captivity, saying, Thus saith the Lord concerning Shimeiah the Nehilamite, because that Shimeiah hath prophesied unto you, and I sent him not. And he hath caused you to trust in a lie. In other words, he's a liar. And he's probably the son of many liars, as Christ alluded to in John chapter 8, verse 32. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shimeiah the Nehilamite and his seed. Uh, what seed do you suppose that is? Maybe Satan's seed, Cain's progeny? He shall not have a man to dwell among this people. In other words, he's going to be cut off from them. Neither shall he behold the good that I will do for my people, saith the Lord. Because he taught rebellion against the Lord. And of course, that is a trademark of the Kenite and of Satan, to rebel against the Lord. And no doubt, this one, probably a Kenite too. Because the Kenites love rebellion, and the children of Israel also love rebellion, who follow after the way of the Kenites. So then, if they do follow rebellion, as the Kenite does, they are no better than a Kenite. But by the same token, if a Kenite come to the truth and change his ways and amend himself, he too shall be accepted. As God told Cain, Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou do well, shall thou not be accepted? At any rate, I think this is where we will stop for this particular lecture, and we will pick it up next in Jeremiah verse 30 or chapter 30, I don't know why I keep saying verse, but uh, I, I really hope you're seeing the spiritual types involved in this because there are so many that do not. And it's really not hard today to be a shining bright beacon light to our Father in this world of darkness. And you can do that by studying your Father's Word and asking His counsel and asking His will and obeying His voice. When he says you're going into captivity, you're going into captivity. Nobody wants to go into captivity, but the captivity of the end times will not be like the captivity of that time. It will be a captivity to deception. A captivity to the false Christ. But it will be very short-lived, only five months. And praise God that it won't be any longer than that. Originally, it was to be a three and a half year period. And as I've often said, I still think the three and a half years are going to play into it. Into the buildup of one world government and global government. I think they will play into it. But we see it approaching more and more every day. Our rights being taken away. Our money being spent as though it's going out of style. Taxation being raised. The poor being pandered to, and I don't mean the real poor. The real poor suffer and live in tent cities, even our veterans. Only the people who call themselves poor, you know, the ones that weigh 300 pounds plus, they're the ones that are pandered to. And they're kept for a voting base. They're bribed to vote. And many of them are not even ashamed of it. They could care less. They're the ones that are going to go into the real captivity. Because they're going to fall, and they're going to bow a knee to Baal. They're going to fall and worship the Antichrist. Because they've been taken care of, and mollycoddled, and baby-fed, 
on all the little entitlements that our government is willing to give them at the expense of the working taxpayer. And, and, and you know, that's another type of captivity that we're in, believe it or not. I should have mentioned that. The taxation that you're forced to pay, some of you out there have to buy your own house and pay your own Medicare or medical costs and uh, pay all your own bills while other people have their pays their bills paid for them by the government. They live on welfare and WIC and SNAP and they get free cell phones and they get free gas and they get put up in free hotels and they get low income housing and reduced school lunches and lowered tuition fees. They get all these things to keep them exactly where they're at. As a people to be pandered to for votes. And they are too blind to see it. Are they not in captivity? At any rate, before I get off on another tangent here, I'm going to... Uh, go ahead and sign off for this particular lecture by saying what I always say. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, it is always my prayer for you that you will study the word of our Father. This letter that he has written to us through the pens of many ages, through the hands of many of his prophets, that you will dig into the languages so that you can understand what is actually meant rather than what it looks like in the black and white of the English on the page. Because there is far more said here than what there looks like. And again, this is the supernatural ability of our Father to speak to us from that time to this time. That's why this word is supernatural and that's why it is called the living word. It is the living word. Christ is the living word. May God bless you and lead you and guide you in light and keep you in his bosom and keep you away from the captivity of the end times as far as uh, to fall and worship the Antichrist because we shall certainly go into captivity. But if we do as God said and we go into the captivity willingly then we shall be protected. We're going to live and make it through. And God's election shall raise up their voices through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and they shall prophesy against this Antichrist. And they're going to convert many just upon the hearing of their voices. And then when Christ returns, it's game over for Satan. At least for a thousand years. And then he's going to be released for another little short season to see who will follow him at that time. Now, those who follow him at that time will go to hell. And I'm not judging anybody. That is what is written. They shall go into the lake of fire, and they shall burn up, and they shall be no more. At any rate, my prayers are that you will not be amongst their ilk. Rather, that you will exceed in studying your Father's Word, and do more than gain life eternal. That you will please your Father, and be a shining light unto him. A beacon on a hill. To let people know that whenever you come through the room. Or wherever you're at. There is a child of God in the room. Not that all are not children of God. But some choose not to be. Just as these hard-headed Israelites. At any rate, may God bless you in all your studies as you diligently seek our Father's word and his counsel and his face from this, his most holy and precious letter to us. God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.